export growth is slowing. The country's drowning in debt, and youth unemployment has soared. More money is leaving China for the first time in 40 years than is coming in from American, Japanese, European, Korean investors. The strategies used by Western countries to reduce risks, combined with moving production to other Asian nations and a global economic downturn, have hit China's economy hard. Right now, China's economy is in big trouble. There are lots of bankruptcies, lots of people losing their jobs, and many workers going back to where they came from, showing that China's economy is about to crash. Life for Chinese people, especially those who move around for work and those without special skills, is really tough. Some people are so desperate for work, they go hungry for three days in a row. Big cities like Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Guangzhou are full of people who can't find work. Those who stay in the city struggle to find jobs, doing whatever they can to make money, and often ending up sleeping on the streets. It's not uncommon for people to go without food for two or three days straight. Older people who can't work anymore collect and sell plastic bottles for a little money and search through trash for food. Businesses are closing down everywhere, and streets that used to be busy are now empty. Many shop owners say they don't have any customers all day. Many companies are closing down, and even those still operating are in a half-dead state. The environment is not favorable, and while there are many people setting up stalls on the streets, there aren't as many buyers. Shopping malls are empty, and it's unclear where everyone has gone. We haven't been paid for two months now, and everything feels difficult. This one closed down, that one closed down, and another one too. Everyone is looking to sell. Running a physical store in 2024 is extremely challenging, there are no customers, no business. Everyone wants to cut their losses. Take a look at our store, there isn't a single person, and the whole street is deserted. This store, which I invested $55,000 in last year and hired a manager and two employees to run, now barely makes any sales in a day. So, on a day like today, they only made $18.67 in sales. The manager and employees, I hired them through friends and paid them a salary of $690 plus commissions. But this year, there's no business, and we're running at a loss, so there are hardly any commissions. They're all just taking a salary of $690. It's really the year 2024, and the losses are too great. Three major industries in China have begun massive layoffs, making finding a job increasingly difficult. Firstly, the real estate-related sector is suffering as property sales plummet, leading to layoffs of sales personnel who relied on commissions. According to First Financial on March 19, the real estate industry continues to suffer losses. Currently, there are 58 real estate companies in the Shanghai and Shenzhen Stock Exchange's real estate sector that have released performance forecasts. Among them, 43 companies are expected to incur non-recurring net losses last year, totaling approximately $8.79 billion to $11.76 billion. When combined with Hong Kong-listed real estate companies, the total loss of the disclosed companies exceeds $150 billion. Secondly, construction workers and migrant laborers are also affected since fewer buildings are being constructed. Previously, construction workers earned high salaries, but now, they're facing unemployment. Lastly, many manufacturing factories are downsizing due to a lack of orders and some are relocating to Southeast Asia for cheaper labor. The situation in 2024 is dire, with numerous challenges in various sectors. It's hard to believe, but many large companies are downsizing or cutting salaries, while small businesses are on the brink of bankruptcy. The average enterprise that was barely making ends meet last year is now facing significant losses. Even prominent brands like Starbucks, Luckin Coffee, and KFC have seen an influx of middle-aged individuals pretending to be employed. In the real estate market, both upstream and downstream sectors are suffering, with properties remaining unsold. The current situation across various industries may be something you haven't encountered in over a decade. The stock market, real estate market, foreign exchange, foreign trade, and employment are declining. Income, consumption, physical stores, and oil prices are falling, while tuition fees, childcare costs, tutoring fees, and prices are rising, leading to increased financial pressure, divorces, debts, and the prevalence of scams, internet celebrities, experts, and scammers. How do you deal with the sharp decline in coal prices, the arrival of a bear market, and the continuous downturn of both coking coal and coke? 
Coking coal has dropped by over $83 per ton after five rounds of declines, with the sixth round imminent. This year has seen the emergence of another losing industry. It's not the restaurant owners facing collective failure and returning to poverty, nor is it the new middle class investing in stocks and real estate. It's the pig farmers. Pigs are being sold for about per kilogram, and a pig weighing over 200 kilograms is losing nearly $40. Weaned piglets are being sold for less than $13.83 each, and a sow giving birth to a litter of piglets is losing at least $276.66. The price of pork has plummeted, down 40% compared to before, almost halving. When you subtract the costs of feed and other breeding expenses, the more pigs you raise, the more you lose. Pig farmers are facing a dilemma. For example, the market value of MUN Foods has evaporated by $7.8 billion in the past two years, let alone small workshops. What's happening this year? Pigs are devalued, cows are collapsing, and the value of sheep farming is diminishing. Even planting crops, such as cabbage, scallions, and corn, is now more unprofitable than ever. What's going on? Now, a large number of private enterprises are moving out. Obtaining a passport has become increasingly rigorous, with extensive questioning and uncertain outcomes, leaving many puzzled about the reasons behind it. Recent reports circulating online suggest that the Chinese authorities have halted passport issuance. It's widely believed that the surge in passport applications has triggered authorities' concerns, prompting various measures to restrict passport issuance. In Jiangsu Province's Lianyingang City, banners denouncing illegal immigration have been prominently displayed, fueling discussions among locals about the suspension of passport services. An individual, using an alias from Hunan Xinyang, expressed frustration over a 20-day wait for passport processing, a delay, causing immense anxiety. Reports suggest similar situations across China, with some regions halting passport services altogether or imposing stricter scrutiny. The entire world appears to be forsaking us. 2024 is set to be the most challenging year for international travel. A woman specializing in handling overseas affairs on the mainland mentioned that going abroad will increasingly become a daunting task. Numerous countries have already closed their borders to us, restricting our entry. Despite some recent visa waivers for tourism, lasting typically no more than a month, with many being just 15 days, study, immigration, and work visas are now inaccessible in many countries. Canada, New Zealand, and Australia are experiencing stagnation in student visa applications. Even Israel. You're aware of the situation. State-owned and private projects, such as those in Canada, are facing waiting times exceeding six months post-registration, with no updates. Japan and Singapore have also redirected their focus towards Southeast Asia. Some may inquire, what about South Korea? Well, South Korea has a labor shortage of 163,000 workers this year, but most of these positions are being filled by labor from Southeast Asian countries. The estimated quota for Chinese workers is only around 1,000. Furthermore, once these 163,000 workers arrive in Korea this year, the labor market will be saturated. There won't be significant hiring in the short term, not even for construction projects, which are lagging behind even during the pandemic years. So, let's reflect. How have we fared since 2023? It seems we've been worse off than during the pandemic years. Why is this happening? It feels like the whole world is abandoning us, isolating us from the global community. We've been in this industry for over a decade, and this is the first time we've encountered such challenges. During the pandemic, there were more avenues for international travel than now. In 2023, we already began to feel the difficulty of going abroad. 2024 will be the toughest year for international travel, and it's only going to get harder. Therefore, if you have the opportunity now, seize it. In the future, there will be fewer and fewer opportunities for us to go abroad. In 2014, Unilever acquired China's Qinyuan Group at an undisclosed price. An anonymous source familiar with the matter revealed that Unilever is currently working with a consulting firm to assess potential buyer's interest. If sold, Qin Yuan is estimated to be valued at around $300 million. Established in 1998 and headquartered in Ningbo, China, Qin Yuan produces water purification products under the Truliva brand. Unilever stated that the acquisition of Qin Yuan was its largest deal in China in over a decade, doubling its scale in the water purification business in the country. Unilever also owns the water purifier brand Purite and the air purifier brand Blue Air. 
The consideration of selling Qinyuan stems from a range of uncertainties, including geopolitical tensions, trade barriers, regulatory challenges, and slowing economic growth, while other companies are also reassessing their operational risks in China. Japanese giant withdraws from China with losses for 10 consecutive years. Recent incidents involving Dutch journalists being denied access to cover protests in the neighboring Sichuan province underscore the ongoing challenges confronting foreign media in China. The Netherlands has decided to close its consulate in Chongqing, a significant move amidst China's struggle to attract foreign investors. The Dutch embassy in Beijing announced on social media platform X, formerly known as Twitter, that it would now handle matters concerning Chongqing and nearby provinces. Reasons for the closure included limited Dutch business presence in the area, as disclosed during a meeting with foreign business representatives in Chengdu. China's foreign ministry respects the Netherlands' decision, affirming each country's right to manage its diplomatic offices. However, tensions between Beijing and Brussels, exacerbated by the Ukraine conflict and trade disputes, have escalated, with concerns over economic security raised by the Dutch intelligence service. The Dutch government's alignment with U.S. policies to restrict China's access to certain high-tech industries has further strained relations. Chongqing hosts consulates from only a few countries, including Japan, Canada, and Hungary. Meanwhile, recent incidents involving Dutch journalists being barred from covering protests in nearby Sichuan province highlight ongoing challenges faced by foreign media in China. When questioned about the incidents, China's foreign ministry spokesperson emphasized the country's commitment to protecting the rights of foreign journalists. Publicly available data shows that since 2023, 10 globally renowned companies have withdrawn from China, including Japan's Canon, South Korea's Samsung, Japan's Sony, Toshiba, Nikon, U.S. Amazon, U.S. LinkedIn, U.S. Minutes Software Development Center, Japan's Astellas Pharma, etc. These companies have relocated their industrial chains to Thailand, the Philippines, or back to their home countries, affecting tens of thousands of Chinese employees. The recent announcement by Canon, a Japanese company, about terminating its operations in Zhuhai, China, marked another departure of a Japanese enterprise from China. This was seen as a considerable loss for the local community, as it resulted in reduced tax revenue and job opportunities. Due to increasing labor costs in the country, many factories had relocated to Southeast Asian countries like Vietnam and India. Additionally, the shrinking market for digital cameras, largely replaced by smartphones, contributed to this situation. With companies like Canon moving away, it was indeed considered a significant loss for the local community. Many people aspired to work in such factories, and now they had to search for new employment opportunities. It appears that major South Korean corporations are pulling out of China. Currently, Latte Chemical has sold all its shares in Latte Sanjian Jiaxing Chemical, while LG's new energy has sold its stake in Jianxiwa Battery. Samsung SDI has also sold its battery assembly companies in Wuxi and Chongqing. Hyundai Motor sold its factories in Beijing and Chongqing in 2021 and 2023, respectively, and plans to sell its factory in Changzhou this year. Hyundai Kia Logistics has also sold all its shares in a joint venture company in Changzhou. These signs indicate that many South Korean companies are withdrawing from China. Previously, individuals were willing to join foreign companies because they not only offered good salaries and benefits but also strictly adhered to labor laws. However, with a large number of foreign companies leaving the Chinese market, it seems like either times are changing or they're being phased out themselves. It makes us wonder, what's really going on? According to Japanese media reports, Samsung Electronics Factory in Tianjin will cease smartphone production by the end of this year. The reason cited is a significant decline in Samsung smartphone sales in China, leading to insufficient factory operations. However, Samsung's smartphone factory in Uezhou, Guangdong, will continue production. Globally, the smartphone market is saturating and Samsung's market share is declining, necessitating a restructuring of its production layout. As reported by the Nikkei on December 13, Samsung's Tianjin factory primarily manufactures smartphones and other electronic products. According to company insiders, smartphone production will cease on December 31st. The news of Samsung withdrawing from the Chinese market has stirred widespread interest and speculation. Despite being a globally renowned electronics manufacturer, the reasons behind Samsung's departure from such a lucrative market have raised questions. Samsung's decision to leave China wasn't abrupt. As far back as 2018, Samsung had already announced the closure of its last factory in Tianjin, aiming to streamline production in China to cut costs and enhance efficiency. However, Samsung's performance in the Chinese smartphone market has consistently disappointed.
With a market share of less than 1% in 2019, Samsung lagged behind dominant local brands like Huawei, Xiaomi, Oppo, and Vivo, leading to a gradual erosion of its market position. Samsung's exit from China is intertwined with the political climate. The escalating U.S.-China trade tensions severely impacted Samsung's operations in China. Retaliatory measures by the Chinese government, such as chip purchase bans and restrictions on Samsung phone sales, further constricted Samsung's presence in the Chinese market. The pandemic also dealt a blow to Samsung's business in China, exacerbating its losses. Sony Corporation of Japan, a Fortune Global 500 company, has recently decided to withdraw from China. Sony, known primarily for producing televisions and cameras, also manufactures semiconductors, chips, and precision sensing instruments. Its annual sales in China contribute to one-third of its global sales. Despite its initial success and popularity in China, Sony's market share has been declining due to competition from domestic brands. As a result, Sony has chosen to completely relocate its production line to Thailand, where it will focus on producing electronic sensors primarily for Western markets like Europe and the US. Sony's presence in China dates back 27 years, initially focusing on after-sales service before expanding into research, development, production, and sales. While Sony once thrived in China and was ranked as one of the world's most beloved brands, its withdrawal indicates deeper reasons beyond market competition. With the ongoing decoupling between China and the US, especially in the semiconductor sector, Sony's operations in China would be severely impacted by potential supply cuts from the US. This situation leaves Sony with no choice but to withdraw from China in the long run. While China's market is significant for manufacturing and labor-intensive industries, some argue that foreign companies like Sony may view it as dispensable, especially considering the trend of continuous withdrawals and relocations to Southeast Asia. This trend, coupled with a decline in the number of Fortune Global 500 companies setting up research and development centers in China since 2018, raises concerns about the country's ability to retain foreign investment and its position in high-tech sectors. Despite China's claims as the world's second-largest economy and largest manufacturing country, its reliance on foreign companies for capacity and foreign trade achievements is evident. The departure of companies like Sony raises questions about China's ability to control its market and compete in high-tech areas independently. After over 40 years of development in China, Toshiba is withdrawing from the country, marking another Japanese giant's diminishing presence in China's business landscape. The decision comes as Toshiba struggles to maintain profitability amidst escalating production costs and diminishing labor advantages in China. The closure of all 33 factories in China by December 2021 reflects a shift of electrical operations to Vietnam and the relocation of research centers back to Japan. This move is attributed to both external and internal factors. Nikon and HP recently announced the closure of multiple legal entities in China, while Foxconn increased its investment in India. These events have been interpreted as signs of disappointment among foreign enterprises regarding the investment environment in China. Particularly perplexing is Nikon's decision to file for bankruptcy liquidation of its subsidiary in northeast China, considering its role in revitalizing the region's old industrial base. However, when interpreting these events, it's essential to maintain a rational and comprehensive perspective. In response to media inquiries, Hewlett Packard stated that one of its entities in Shanghai has been in a dormant state for the past few years and has not engaged in any business activities or hired any employees. With approval from the headquarters, the deregistration process has been completed smoothly. This action should not affect the normal operations of Hewlett Packard's other two companies in Shanghai. While deregistration is a regular business operation, withdrawal of investment is a different matter, signifying the company's decision to actively withdraw from the market. Will Hewlett Packard leave China? Based on common sense, it seems unlikely. The company's main products, printers, and computers, are produced using an outsourcing model similar to Apple's. The production bases in mainland China, located in Chongqing and Shanghai, mainly handle trade and marketing. If withdrawal happens, it will likely start with the outsourcing factories before affecting Shanghai companies. Therefore, the deregistration of Hewlett Packard's Shanghai entity may not be the precursor to a larger storm. Despite concerns, recent years have seen rumors of Hewlett Packard's commercial laptop manufacturer relocating to Mexico. This shift could be due to rising labor costs, trade protectionism, and the uncertainties caused by the COVID 19 pandemic, impacting China's manufacturing advantage. Nikon's subsidiary in northeast China has been operating at a loss for many years, with losses exacerbated during the pandemic, making bankruptcy liquidation a logical step. 
On the other hand, HP's closure of multiple sales companies is primarily the result of business adjustments. Foxconn's significant investment in India has attracted attention, as a global supply chain giant heavily reliant on manufacturing in China suddenly increases its investment in India, raising questions about whether it is divesting from the Chinese market. While specific reasons are unclear, large export-oriented enterprises like Foxconn are facing significant pressure. The looming shadow of the U.S.-China trade war and supply chain disruptions caused by the pandemic have led to a re-evaluation of globalization, prompting enterprises to adjust and rebalance their global footprint. The announcement by the American e-commerce giant Amazon to withdraw from the Chinese market underscores the sheer magnitude and potential of China's economy. Amazon's decision to exit the Chinese market undoubtedly reflects a challenging reality. It suggests that Amazon no longer sees viable prospects for growth and sustainability in China's market. Public data shows that in terms of market share in the Chinese e-commerce market, Amazon China held a peak market share of 15.8% in 2008, which was the only high point for Amazon China. After that, its market share gradually decreased year by year, with figures from 2012 to 2018 as follows. 2.3%, When Amazon's e-commerce market share dropped to 0.6%, Tmall, JD.com, and Pinduoduo held market shares of 55%, 25.2%, and 5.7% respectively. The data clearly illustrates that Amazon China was being squeezed by the aggressive players in China's e-commerce landscape. The space for Amazon China's development was shrinking, while the tripartite dominance formed by Alibaba, JD.com, and Pinduoduo was becoming more stable. According to a message from LinkedIn's public account on May 9, 2023, the professional networking platform will cease its localized job search service, LinkedIn Workplace, in China by August 9, 2023. Additionally, business clients will no longer be able to recruit talent in mainland China or use related inside functions. Furthermore, the individual job posting feature and the China-specific LinkedIn Recruitment Special Edition will also be discontinued. LinkedIn attributed the decision to cease LinkedIn workplace services in China to increasingly fierce market competition and challenges in the macroeconomic environment, leading to the necessity of ceasing services. This adjustment will result in the cessation of product and engineering teams in China, as well as the reduction of positions in functions, business, and marketing departments. Recently, Japan's largest tire manufacturer, Bridgestone, closed its factory in Shenyang, laying off more than a thousand employees. Pictured is Bridgestone's headquarters in Japan. As the Chinese economy continues to decline, foreign companies are accelerating their exodus. Recently, Japan's largest tire manufacturer, Bridgestone, closed its factory in Shenyang, laying off more than a thousand employees. Since last year, 10 well-known foreign companies have left China, affecting tens of thousands of Chinese employees. According to Bridgestone's notice issued on February 27, the company stopped producing commercial vehicle tires at its Shenyang factory on January 26 and closed the factory on February 29. It is expected to terminate commercial vehicle tire production and sales in China in the first half of 2024. Financial scholar Si Ling told Radio Free Asia that Japan was one of the earliest source countries of foreign investment in China. In recent years, including Japan, many foreign companies have withdrawn from China. The trend of foreign companies voting with their feet indicates an accelerated pace of withdrawal, which is inconsistent with the praise given by the CCP government to its business environment. Li Hua, a Shenyang businessman engaged in the import and export trade of electronic products, told Radio Free Asia that in recent years, not only Japanese-funded enterprises but also American, German, and even domestic private enterprises have withdrawn from the Chinese market. In November of last year, global polling giant Gallup also announced its withdrawal from China. Gallup is one of the world's most well-known polling companies, with a branch in China specializing in education and training. Unfortunately, Gallup has made the decision to close its business in China, a notice from Gallup to its customers read, as seen by the Financial Times. The Financial Times cited three sources as revealing that Gallup notified its clients that the company is withdrawing from China and some ongoing projects will be moved overseas while others will be cancelled. The report pointed out that the operation of American consulting companies in China has become increasingly difficult. In addition to the economic downturn in China, the CCP's security agencies have also intensified their scrutiny and surveillance of consulting companies. 
American consulting firms Bain & Company, Mintz Group, and CapVision have all been raided and searched by CCP security personnel. The report said that as Gallup withdraws from China, other multinational consulting firms are also scaling back their operations in China. Forrester Market Consulting, focusing on technology consulting, has laid off most of its Chinese employees. Gerson Lerman Group in the United States began layoffs last summer. As the Chinese New Year approaches, the government's debt is causing hardship for migrant workers. As the end of the year approaches, contractors and migrant workers find themselves in dire straits, often facing repression or threats as they seek to recover overdue project funds and wages. Lei Ming, a contractor from Jiangsu Province, revealed the dire situation faced by many who have undertaken government projects, resulting in financial ruin. This predicament stems from rampant corruption among local government officials and their lack of integrity, leading to prolonged delays in releasing project funds. Contractors and subcontractors are burdened with heavy debts due to the need to finance projects up front. As the year-end approaches, they not only fail to recover project funds but also face pressure from creditors. Lei Ming explained that in one project, even if business is not good, the local Communist Party secretary still demands millions of yuan annually. Contractors like Lei Ming are left with only a fraction of their earnings, while their owed project funds are withheld, and they are forbidden from speaking out. Many have resorted to borrowing large sums from banks, only to have their properties and assets seized. Lei Ming recounted his involvement in a project to renovate shanty towns in Su Prefecture, where out of 36 buildings planned, only 12 were completed due to the county government's failure to provide funding. Attempts to demand payment from the county government were met with repression. After four years, with no payment received, half of the project remains unfinished. Lei Ming, along with hundreds of other small contractors and thousands of workers, faces continual struggles to claim their wages, often encountering arrest before reaching the county government office. The tightening grip of authorities prevents them from even carrying mobile phones or taking photos, with frequent summons to the police station for interrogation. Mr. Guo, a migrant worker from Fujian province, expressed that dozens of workers have had their wages withheld and face threats when demanding payment. With local government departments failing to take action, many workers have no choice but to return home early. They plan to only work as daily wage laborers in the future. Mr. Gwa stated, the houses in our unit are being renovated, and the contract was given to a third party. However, the third party did not pay our wages, claiming that they were instructed by the government to do so. We reported to the police and sought assistance from the street office, the court, and labor supervision, but no one has taken any action. We feel helpless. Mr. Liang, an employee of China Railway, revealed that it's common practice within state-owned enterprises like China Railway to delay payments for construction projects and other expenses. Despite being a publicly traded company, its financial reports are often embellished, masking the fact that it consistently operates at a loss. Mr. Liang stated, when we build railways and roads, it's considered a political task, so delayed payments are frequent. Arrears in materials, labor fees, and subcontractor payments are widespread. It's common for subcontractors to be owed money, and it's not unusual for us to go several months without receiving our wages. As the Chinese New Year approaches, protests and wage disputes by workers are occurring daily across the country. On February 6, 2024, in Zhangjiang Town, Guigong City, the Hakka Impression City owed wages to 130 migrant workers. Despite petitioning efforts to the Guigong Petition Bureau, they were unsuccessful in obtaining their overdue salaries. Similarly, on February 5, 2024, in Huanghua City, Hebei Province, workers at Hebei Jinbang New Materials Company, Limited, involved in projects related to 80,000 tons of annual epoxy resin production and 200,000 tons of annual potassium sulfate production, blocked entrances, and demanded overdue wages. Meanwhile, a large number of small and micro-enterprises are closing down, exacerbating the already difficult situation for laborers. The unhealthy state of China's small and micro-enterprises is affecting the employment of 180 million people. The Chinese economy continues to decline, 
with a recent survey by the Renmin University of China indicating that more than one-third of small and micro-enterprises are financially unhealthy, facing numerous risks that could impact the employment prospects of 180 million people. The China Inclusive Finance Research Institute, COFI, of Renmin University conducted a study titled Financial Health of Small and Micro-Enterprises, based on 2,349 questionnaires, and recently released a report on the financial health of small and micro-enterprises. The report highlights the need for particular attention to be paid to small and micro-enterprises in regions such as Hunan and Shanxi, where the proportion of financially unhealthy enterprises is relatively high. In Guangxi and Chongqing, there is a phenomenon of polarization in the financial health of small and micro-enterprises. Examining the time of establishment of enterprises, those established for three to five years and over eight years tend to have poorer financial health, warranting focused attention. In terms of daily financial management, the issue of overdue accounts receivable is particularly severe for small and micro-enterprises, leading to significant pressure on cash flow that requires special attention. Within the very unhealthy category, approximately 80 peccant of small and micro-enterprises are unable to recover accounts receivable on time. The Chinese economy is in a mess, with various waves of unemployment erupting, and homeowners facing foreclosure are forced to leave their homes and end up on the streets. This morning, our neighbor's house was foreclosed by the court just because they missed last month's mortgage payment. The court forced them to move out, and the couple, with two young children, one in elementary school and the other just starting kindergarten, were seen packing up their belongings. The family of four, with the wife wiping away tears as she packed, and the husband standing nearby with a pale face, appeared distressed. The two children, unaware of what was happening, were happily playing in the corridor. It's really hard to imagine how they will manage to get by in the future. It might even lead to divorce, I in fact, I've already handled hundreds of foreclosed properties in Shenzhen and have seen nearly a hundred broken families. But even so, this situation still feels incredibly painful, like something is blocking my heart. So, I sincerely advise everyone that if you don't have much money on hand and your income isn't stable, be cautious about buying a house. Nowadays, many people buy houses like they buy cell phones. If a couple's combined monthly income is just over 10,000, they dare to buy a house with a monthly mortgage payment of over 10000 My goodness! This kind of home buying behavior is simply suicidal. Buying a house now is completely different from before. In the past, you could buy a house with your eyes closed and still make a profit from rising prices. But now, houses have returned to being primarily for living and improving quality of life. Comfortable and affordable amenities are the top priority. Just make sure the size is adequate. To be honest, what's the scariest thing about living in Shenzhen? It's not having money. Everything requires money, food, children's education, even flushing the toilet. Even if you don't eat or drink, you still have to pay property management fees every month. If one day you can't afford to repay your mortgage, the bank will sell your house at a discount or even auction it off at 56 peccant of its value. In the end, we'll be responsible for selling your foreclosed property. I truly hope there were no foreclosed homes in this world, but by the time it reaches us, it's already out of our hands. Recently, there have been more and more foreclosed properties in Shenzhen, and tragedies like this happen every day. I sincerely hope you won't be one of them. College students working two shifts for six yuan an hour, only to end up not getting paid at all, has really pushed the limits of understanding. Yesterday, I went for interviews for three jobs, and my goodness, I couldn't believe how low the wages they offered were. It felt like a blatant violation of labor laws. The first job interview I went to was at Luke King Coffee. I had asked them in advance on WeChat about the wage, and for the first 15 days, it's 8 yuan per hour. Can you believe there are people getting paid even less than us at this Luke King Coffee branch? So, for the first 15 days, it's 8 yuan per hour, and if you pass the barista certification, it's 15 yuan per hour for the next 15 days. If you don't pass, it's 12 yuan per hour. Basically, it's around 2,000 yuan for the first month, 2,700 yuan for the second month, and from the third month onwards, it's just base pay plus performance incentives. 
Then I thought about it and went for an interview at another place, a convenience store. When I asked about the wage and working hours, they said they pay by the day, 60 yuan for a shift, and a shift is 9 hours long. Plus, the morning shift starts at 7 o'clock. I haven't woken up at 7 o'clock since I was preparing for the postgraduate entrance exam. And now, just for 60 yuan, I have to start work at 7 in the morning, which means I have to get up at 6. It's outrageous. Even though at this convenience store, all you have to do is handle cash and accounts, and you can use your phone or study, but think about it, 60 yuan a day, if I work for a full 30 days, I'll only make 1,800 yuan, just 1,800 yuan. And who would wake up at 6 in the morning to go to work for 6 yuan per hour? The current situation in the freight market is dire, with many truck drivers unable to afford meals anymore. Many long-haul truck drivers can no longer afford to eat. You may not believe it if you're not in this industry, but it's the harsh reality. Unconsciously, I've been stranded here for four days without any work. And it's snowing again. Every morning, I buy a pastry to eat, and for lunch, I get a fast food meal from the cafeteria here, which costs about 15 yuan each. The same goes for the afternoon, another 15 yuan meal. So, in total, I spend about 36 to 37 yuan a day here. I'm not bragging about it. But many drivers can't even afford to eat. I have a few fellow drivers here, and when I offer to buy them meals, they refuse. They say they can just cook an egg in their truck. By noon, when I offer them food again, they say they can just boil a few eggs. I've been trying to treat them for days, but they feel embarrassed to accept. So, I've stopped inviting them to eat with me. Anyway, we're all stuck in our trucks, looking for cargo on our phones. It didn't used to be like this. When I first started driving, no matter how far, I would find a hotel or inn to stay. Now, most of us just stay in our trucks. Even though I'm in my truck, I still need to eat. Usually, if there's a restaurant nearby, I'll try to eat there for all three meals. But I don't know when it started, even if there's a restaurant, many drivers are afraid to go. They just cook instant noodles or boil some eggs in their trucks. They all say, saving money is still money. I may not have reached that point yet, but if I keep living like this, I think one day, I'll end up like them, cooking meals in my truck. It's really tough. People from all walks of life are struggling without seeing any signs of improvement or hope. This is the current situation for ordinary people in China. This was the scene when I went to the supermarket around 9 o'clock in Hong Kong. There's no rice, no flour, nothing. It seems like there's not much left. What happened to the street? This used to be very busy, now look at it. This supermarket in Hong Kong is empty like they are in a war zone. The economic downturn in Hong Kong has been precipitated by several critical factors, with the enactment of the national security law at the forefront, creating a domino effect on the city's economic vitality and global image. This law has induced a palpable sense of apprehension among international investors and local businesses concerned about the erosion of Hong Kong's autonomy and its world-renowned legal and business framework. Adding to these woes, Hong Kong's stringent pandemic measures, among the world's strictest, have significantly isolated the city from both international visitors and its biggest source of tourists, mainland China. The impact is stark. Prior to the pandemic, in 2018, Hong Kong hosted an average of 5.4 million visitors a month, a figure that dwindled dramatically in the ensuing years. The West Kowloon shopping mall was almost deserted at 9 p.m., and many shops were forced to close. Thousands of shops closed. Hong Kong has fallen so deep. 
There is no nightlife in Hong Kong, and it has become very deserted now. It is still early in the evening, and only convenience stores are open on the street. The cessation of this vital stream of tourists has had a cascade effect on the retail, hospitality, and service sectors, pivotal components of Hong Kong's consumer economy. In stark contrast to earlier years when these sectors thrived on high-spending tourists, recent times have seen a shift toward a more budget-conscious visitor demographic. The loss in consumer traffic and spending is palpable, with Hong Kong's GDP growth decelerating to 3.2 peck in in 2023 from previous years, highlighting the stark economic challenges the city faces. According to recent data from the Hong Kong Tourism Development Bureau, from January to November 2023, only 30.07 million visitors came to Hong Kong, significantly lower than the 52 million visitors in the same period in 2019 before the mask-related events occurred. This represents less than 60 percent of the tourist numbers from the same period in 2019. There are three evident reasons contributing to this decline in Hong Kong's appeal. Firstly, Hong Kong's role as a gateway to the world for China has diminished. Hong Kong was once a city where East and West cultures converged, providing a unique blend of Western cultural heritage and inclusiveness. However, the intensification of competition and conflicts between China and the United States has impacted Hong Kong's status as a window for international exchange. Secondly, the allure of duty-free goods in Hong Kong has decreased. Hong Kong, as a free port, used to offer tax-free imports and a variety of international brands at lower prices compared to the mainland. However, with the further opening up of mainland China and the establishment of free trade zones, individuals can now purchase duty-free goods locally, reducing the cost advantage of Hong Kong. Thirdly, the high cost of consumption in Hong Kong is undeniable. Expenses such as hotel accommodations in Hong Kong have risen, surpassing the average levels of 2018. This means that the cost of consumption during economic downturns is now higher than during economic prosperity, which has led to reluctance among Chinese tourists to stay in Hong Kong even for evening shopping. Without many tourists, Hong Kong's airports look deserted. Mainland China suffered the same fate. This airport looks like it has no one. The ramifications of these overarching issues on local businesses have been profound. Operational costs have surged as revenues plummet, a situation captured by the phenomenon of the two-dish rice, symbolizing the declining purchasing power and consumer confidence. The shift towards more budget-conscious consumer behavior has forced businesses, previously catering to luxury markets, to realign their offerings to meet a more price-sensitive demand. This economic downturn was further exacerbated by the allure of cheaper alternatives in neighboring regions, like Shenzhen, which led to a significant outflow of consumer spending from Hong Kong, intensifying the struggles of local businesses. The retail and food and beverage sectors, heavily reliant on tourist and local consumer spending, have been particularly hard hit. Retail sales in Hong Kong, for instance, saw a year-on-year -year increase of 15.9 percent in November 2023, but this is off a low base and followed years of decline during the pandemic. Moreover, Hong Kong's economy is forecasted to face further challenges, with GDP growth expected to slow to 2.7 percent in 2024, reflecting ongoing economic headwinds including high interest rates, geopolitical tensions, and a sluggish property market. Over 60 percent of companies surveyed by the Hong Kong General Chamber of Commerce expect no income growth in 2024, evidencing the mass escape among the business community. Recently, major companies such as Samsung, Apple, and Mitsubishi Toyota have been gradually relocating from China, especially in Hong Kong, shifting their production bases to Southeast Asia and the Indian market. How substantial is this exodus? According to data, in 2021, foreign investment surpassed our net investment by an astonishing dollar 170 billion. Unexpectedly, the situation took a drastic turn in 2022, with foreign capital consistently withdrawing dollar 160 billion for six consecutive quarters until the end of September this year. Such a massive capital outflow is quite rare in history and has led to a negative foreign direct investment figure for the first time since the beginning of economic reforms and opening up. 
As we know, investment, consumption, and exports are the three driving forces behind GDP growth. Foreign invested enterprises contribute nearly half of the total export value, with some regions like Zhengzhou and Hunan accounting for over 60 peck in. These contributions are factored into our GDP, contribute taxes, and aid in earning foreign exchange. Every year, they generate an impressive dola 1.3 trillion in foreign exchange, constituting one-third of our national foreign exchange reserves. It's crucial to note that imports such as petroleum, food, and chips require payment in U.S. dollars. One might wonder if foreign companies are not making money off us. The reality is, even if they make significant profits, a substantial portion is taken back, leaving a smaller share for us. For instance, Apple, for every dola 100 billion it generates, takes away dola 70 billion, leaving only dola 30 billion. In the absence of these foreign enterprises, we wouldn't get anything. Importantly, when foreign companies leave, it impacts not only them but also a vast network of associated upstream and downstream enterprises, potentially dozens, hundreds, or even thousands of businesses. Once foreign companies depart, these affiliated enterprises lose orders, face bankruptcy, and may lead to mass layoffs. Where will these employees find new jobs? Mass exodus and free press plummet, signaling an existential threat to the city's future. The demographic landscape of Hong Kong is undergoing a significant transformation as a notable segment of its population opts for migration, signaling a profound discontent with the city's socio-political and economic outlook. This exodus, described as the most extensive in recent history, is reshaping the very essence of Hong Kong's society. According to a report by the Hong Kong Public Opinion Research Institute, as cited by various sources in 2022, more than 40 pecken of the population expressed desires to emigrate, with countries like the UK, Canada, and Australia being top preferences. This mass migration trend reflects deep-seated anxieties over diminishing freedoms and a perceived erosion of autonomy from Beijing's tightening grip. Economically, the outflow poses a potential crisis, risking a brain drain that could deplete the city of its skilled workforce. The social fabric of Hong Kong is equally at risk, with traditional support networks and community bonds threatened by the growing diaspora. Press freedom and political repression, the diminishing right to information. In a parallel decline, Hong Kong's once-cherished press freedom has plummeted, moving from the 80th position in the 2021 World Press Freedom Index to a stark 140th in 2023, according to reporters without borders. This nosedive in press freedom rankings underscores the territory's struggle under the weight of the national security law, which since its implementation in 2020 has led to the arrest of numerous journalists and the shuttering of several prominent media outlets. For instance, the closure of Apple Daily, a leading pro-democracy newspaper, and the arrest of its founder, Jimmy Lai, symbolize the formidable pressures facing the free press. The government's aggressive posture towards dissent and information control not only stifles journalistic freedom but also encroaches upon the public's right to access unbiased and comprehensive news. This constriction of the information landscape is more than an affront to media, it's a blow to the democratic ethos of Hong Kong, affecting its international image and standing as a bastion of freedom in Asia. The confluence of a significant exodus and the marked decline in press freedom signifies a pivotal juncture for Hong Kong, pointing towards a profound identity and cultural shift. These trends not only bear immediate repercussions on the city's economic vibrancy and social cohesion but also pose fundamental questions about its future. With a substantial portion of the populace seeking lives beyond its shores and the press under unprecedented duress, Hong Kong's global stature as a free, dynamic metropolis is under scrutiny. The evolving narrative of Hong Kong, amid these challenges, remains uncertain. Whether these transformations signal a transient phase or a definitive reorientation of its trajectory will depend on how the city navigates these pressing issues in the years to come. Hong Kong property meltdown, dwindling values, and stock market plunge spell economic crisis. The real estate industry in Hong Kong has historically been a bedrock of the city's economy, contributing significantly to its international stature as a financial center. However, recent developments have seen this once thriving market face unprecedented challenges. 
Key among the factors influencing this downturn has been the enactment of the national security law in 2020, compounding three years of strict pandemic control measures, which collectively have altered the economic and social landscape of Hong Kong. The decline in property values has been mirrored in the performance of the stock market, signifying a loss of confidence among investors in Hong Kong's economic resilience. Amidst a continuous decline in both the property and stock markets, reports as of January 2024 painted a gloomy picture. Property, once considered a safe and lucrative investment in Hong Kong, has seen depreciating values, challenging the city's status as a prime real estate hub. Adding shock to this scenario is the reported slump in home prices to the lowest in seven years as indicated by government data. With little relief in sight for 2024, forecasts suggest that home prices might dip further by 3-5% to in the first half of the year before stabilizing somewhat in the latter half. This downturn is correlated with broader economic indicators, including a reduction in retail and dining business operations and a decrease in international tourism and local spending. Furthermore, the Hang Seng Property Index plunged 30 peck in in 2023, reflecting a stark 60 peck in drop from its peak in April 2019, underlining the diminishing investor confidence and economic strain faced by Hong Kong. The implications of declining property values extend beyond investors and homeowners, affecting the broader economy of Hong Kong. Real estate is intertwined with various economic segments, including construction, finance, and retail. As property values plummet, the knock-on effects could lead to reduced consumer spending, a dip in construction activities, and a cautious approach from foreign investors contemplating their stance in Hong Kong. The outlook for 2024 does not bode well for recovery, industry experts anticipate further challenges as higher interest rates persist and economic growth lags. For instance, Luxury residential markets are expected to see falls of 15 peck in to 20 peck in in values, including townhouses, as higher mortgage costs and fewer mainland buyers continue to impact the market. The commercial sector, particularly the office and retail spaces, anticipates a moderate growth driven by specific demands but overall remains in the shadow of uncertainty. Hong Kong's property market is enduring a challenging phase, reflective of broader economic setbacks. As the city navigates through these tumultuous times, the resilience of its real estate sector, once the envy of many, is put to the test, setting the scene for potentially transformative shifts in one of the world's most dynamic urban landscapes. The recovery path seems arduous and contingent on a myriad of economic, social, and political stabilizations aiming to recapture the confidence of both local and international stakeholders in Hong Kong's property market. Let me tell you a cruel truth about one Joe now. You might find it hard to believe that many Wanzhou residents, especially business owners, are living in extremely difficult conditions. Unlike previous years, when factories were busiest at this time, it's like filling bags with money at the end of the year, this year is different. It's not because there are no orders, it's because many factories dare not take orders. In our current shoe business, we might have to wait for three months or even more exaggeratedly, six months to receive payment. Before the Chinese New Year, we can't get the money, but we still have to pay our workers' salaries, sell payments to suppliers, and cover production costs. If we don't pay utilities, the landlord will immediately cut them off, and if we don't pay rent, we'll be evicted. So, it's really tough. We can't take big orders now, and even small orders are risky because of the poor market conditions. If we encounter a customer who disappears without paying, we would end up working for nothing in a year. That's why moving forward feels like stepping into an abyss, and stepping back feels like facing a cliff. It's really challenging. I went for three job interviews yesterday, and oh my, I couldn't believe how low their salaries were, it felt like a violation of labor laws. The first interview was at Luke King Coffee, and I had asked in advance through WeChat. Luke King Coffee pays 8 yuan per hour for the first 15 days. Is there anyone paid lower than us in this area? It's 8 yuan per hour for the first 15 days. Then, if you pass the barista certification, it's 15 yuan per hour. If you don't pass, it's 12 yuan per hour. In simple terms, I asked in the store, and it's around 2,000 yuan for the first month. 
2,700 yuan for the second month, and from the third month onwards, it's a basic salary plus performance pay. I considered it for a moment and went for the interview. The next job was at a convenience store. For convenience stores, they calculate the pay by day. It's 60 yuan for a day's work, and how long is a shift? 9 hours. Also, the morning shift starts at 7 a.m. I haven't woken up at 7 a.m. since I was preparing for the postgraduate entrance exam. Now, just for 60 yuan, I have to start work at 7 a.m., which means I have to wake up at 6 a.m. I can't believe how crazy this is. It's really tough to run a fish market, extremely challenging. There's no business at the fish market, we don't want to just stay flat, and we don't want to lie down and win either. But we can't get it rolling. Look, there's not a single customer. Can I go out on the street to attract people? You see, running a fish market is truly not easy. The government lacks an alternative fiscal option. Even in affluent regions like the Yangtze River Delta and the Pearl River Delta, many government officials complain about the lack of funds, unable to pay salaries. You can imagine the situation. In places like Shand and Nanhai in the Pearl River Delta, including the Jiangsu Zhujiang region, they are unable to pay salaries. Civil servants are facing pay cuts, and teachers are dealing with salary reductions and subsidies. What's the reason behind all this? The inability to achieve an eight-hour workday in five days, despite being a violation of labor laws, continues with constant overtime. The reason is simple, a significant portion of employment in China relies on low-end manufacturing industries with extremely low basic salaries ranging from 1580 yuan to 2580 yuan. Considering the expenses of buying a car, a house, supporting a family, and even affording meals, many people choose voluntary overtime as they dare not offend these companies. The simple reason is that the high-end sector hasn't fully developed, lacking pricing power. It's unable to rely on technology or patents to make money. Faced with the choice between two evils, companies are forced to continue providing employment opportunities without hiring additional staff. These companies depend on squeezing surplus labor and value to generate profits. If the situation were to be properly regulated, these companies might not even have profits, and they might relocate to areas with higher profits, attracting even lower wage workers. This is why China's touted demographic dividend is based on the availability of cheap labor. A master's graduate in liberal arts criticized low salaries at job fairs with an average wage of only 4,000 yuan. This became a trending topic on Chinese social media. Some people were angry, considering it a waste of talent for graduates from top universities to earn the same as security guards. Others argued that these students were too picky and unwilling to endure hardships. To discuss things objectively, China has around 50 million companies, with only about 5,000 listed companies. After excluding a few hundred thousand state-owned enterprises, the remaining 99% are small and medium-sized enterprises, providing 80% of employment opportunities. Most of these SMEs have low technical barriers, so they don't require high academic qualifications and can't afford high salaries. They seek individuals who are inexpensive, reliable, and willing to work hard. For young people, a fresh graduate's monthly salary of 6,000 yuan to 7,000 yuan is considered reasonable for a white-collar position. Having a bachelor's degree is a plus, but even without a college diploma, it's acceptable. So, aiming for high wages at offline job fairs is the wrong approach. Additionally, even in large companies, not all positions offer high salaries. In any industry, regardless of company size or job position, there are generally four categories, technical, functional, business, and support. From the average perspective, technical roles are lucrative, with high entry barriers and high salaries. Functional roles are the least cost-effective, with high entry barriers and low salaries. Business roles have low entry barriers but high salaries, and successful individuals often emerge from this category. The final category, support services, has low entry barriers and low salaries but is the easiest. So, Individuals should assess their job types to determine their direction for higher wages. Even if you join a large company and work in a core technical or business position with a high salary, most people won't make it to the management level. Therefore, by the age of 35, the salary ceiling is around 10,000 yuan to 20,000 yuan per month. Only industries like finance, the internet, and high-tech can break through this salary limit. This outlines the earning path for a wage earner. As a wage earner in China, even if you have a stable and respectable job within the system, the earnings remain similar. In lower-tier cities, 
the monthly salary for units on the outskirts is around 5,000 yuan. For top-tier cities, popular units don't exceed 20,000 yuan. Looking ahead to 2024, it's essential not to deceive yourself into thinking tomorrow, the day after, or next year will be better. New growth points are still far away. This is not pessimism, but a call to face reality. For private entrepreneurs seeking improvement in the coming year, it's crucial to understand what happened in the past, how it was resolved, how much time it took, and how much capability is needed. Evaluate whether next year will be better or worse with a pragmatic attitude. The economy will face a relatively challenging period in the next five years. This is a rational analysis because the current total social debt is several times China's GDP, and solving the issue of social debt won't happen within five years. GDP Deception The Truth Behind China's Dubious 5.2% GDP Growth Announcement In 2023, China grappled with substantial economic hurdles, marked by soaring unemployment rates, widespread salary slashes, and a wave of business closures. Despite these adversities, the Chinese Communist Party CCP, declared a noteworthy 5.2% growth in GDP for the year, a proclamation met with skepticism from experts. Premier Li Chang, in a bid to showcase optimism, delivered a message of economic amelioration and a steadfast commitment to openness during the Davos Forum. Nevertheless, doubts persist among economists, corporate leaders, and the workforce, particularly as private entrepreneurs voice apprehensions about the challenging business landscape. The unveiling of China's economic data for 2023, touting a GDP growth surpassing 5%, failed to instill confidence in the stock market. Significant drops were observed in major Chinese stock indices, underscoring a prevalent lack of faith, particularly among foreign investors who divested a substantial amount. Analysts underscore disparities in China's economic data, pinpointing a struggling stock market, challenges in the real estate sector, and obstacles confronting the three pillars of the economy, investment, consumption, and exports. The CCP's credibility comes under scrutiny as experts entertain the possibility of China being in an economic recession. Apprehensions surface regarding the opacity and politicization of statistical data, casting doubt on the veracity of the reported figures. Voices of skepticism resonate through international media, economic analysis circles, and even former officials, all underscoring doubts about China's economic trajectory. They accentuate the adverse effects of the real estate crisis, banking woes, and the withdrawal of global capital. Premier Li Chang's endeavors to attract foreign investment face critique, particularly from foreign business leaders who shed light on the stringent financial regulations and the challenging regulatory milieu imposed by the CCP. Global fund managers' pessimism is evident as foreign funds are withdrawn from the Chinese stock market. This exodus of foreign businesses and investments is attributed to the prevailing political climate under the CCP. The overarching sentiment is that optimism about China's economic resurgence, based on the CCP's narrative, is likely to result in disappointment. The focus is on the formidable challenges and skepticism enveloping China's economic landscape. More German firms leave China or consider exit. The results of a recent survey conducted by the German Chamber of Commerce in China reveal a significant shift in the dynamics of German companies' presence in the Chinese market. Over the past four years, the proportion of German firms contemplating an exit from or actually leaving the Chinese market has surged, reaching a noteworthy 9%. The survey sheds light on the myriad challenges confronting German enterprises operating in China. These challenges encompass heightened competition from local companies, disparities in market access, prevailing economic headwinds, and geopolitical risks, as highlighted by the Chamber. Ulf Reinhardt, chairperson of the Chamber for Southern China, described the past year as a reality check for German companies engaged in business activities within China. Among the 566 firms surveyed between September 5 and October 6, a notable 2% indicated that they were divesting their business operations in China. Additionally, 7% expressed contemplation of such a move. These figures mark a substantial increase from the 4% reported in 2020. Significantly, 44% of the surveyed companies have proactively taken measures to mitigate risks associated with their operations in China, including the establishment of supply chains independent of the Chinese market. This survey aligns with the government strategy, unveiled six months ago, aimed at reducing Germany's economic reliance on China, its largest trading partner.
It corroborates earlier reports by Reuters, indicating a trend of German firms diversifying away from dependence on the Chinese market. The broader context involves global concerns about China's assertive stance toward Taiwan, its activities in the South China Sea, and its tightening control over the domestic economy. Many Western countries are actively promoting risk mitigation strategies in response. Amid these developments, a significant 86% of German firms acknowledge perceiving a downward trajectory in China's economy. China's recovery from the pandemic has proven to be less robust than anticipated, with challenges such as a deepening property crisis, rising deflationary risks, and subdued demand casting a shadow over the outlook for the year. Several manufacturing companies are pulling out of Shenzhen and Guangzhou. The first casualties in this unfolding scenario are the factories, especially those heavily dependent on Western orders. Recently, Shenzhen Daquawa Acoustics Electronics, Shenzhen, limited company, a well-established Hong Kong-funded toy factory operating for nearly 30 years, and once a contract manufacturer for globally renowned toy companies such as Disney, announced a halt in its operations. In a notice issued on January 13, Daquawa Acoustics, Shenzhen, cited severe operational pressure due to adverse conditions caused by the pandemic and the current economic environment. The company has long faced losses, with insufficient income to cover expenses and no signs of improvement. Consequently, starting from January 12, 2024, the company will cease production and disband all its employees. Headquartered in Hong Kong, Daquawa Acoustics Electronics, Shenzhen, Limited Company established its mainland factory in Longgang District, Shenzhen, in 1994, employing over 2,000 staff. The company exports its products to countries such as Europe, the United States, and Japan. Daquawa Acoustics is a globally renowned high-end electronic toy manufacturer involved in design, research and development, production, and sales. The company specializes in plastic electronic toys, remote control toys, electric toys, and high-end electronic consumable products. Its contract clients include major global toy companies such as Mattel, Sega, Tomy, and Disney. The impact on migrant workers is evident as factories shutter, resulting in a massive loss of jobs. Once thriving factories, like the one in Dongguan, now stand deserted, with idle machinery. Factory owners, including John Whalewin, founder of D Works Precision, have witnessed a significant decline in orders, with some enterprises on the brink of closure due to substantial losses. The shortage of orders, supply chain shifts, and reduced overseas orders have created a challenging environment for foreign trade enterprises, particularly those catering to European and American markets. Small-scale restaurants in Shanghai, like Ali's Beef Noodle Restaurant, face tough times due to reduced consumer spending power and fewer migrant workers, leading to closures. Furthermore, numerous factories, particularly those reliant on orders from Western countries, notably the United States, have been significantly affected, resulting in a substantial loss of orders. Reports indicate that in Guangzhou alone, approximately 1,800 factories have shut down, underscoring the severity of the situation. These closures have triggered a distressing trend where a considerable number of workers are being denied their rightful wages. A factory worker in Guangzhou lamented the factory's bankruptcy, highlighting the financial turmoil faced by both businesses and workers. The non-payment of wages appears to be on the rise, raising concerns about worker exploitation and the broader implications for the workforce. According to data from the China Labor Bulletin, CLB, which monitors workers' rights in China, there has been a staggering increase in labor disputes and cases of labor rights violations. As of November 2023, there were 16,104 reported cases, surpassing annual figures from the past three years. Guangdong Province, known for its numerous factories, remains at the epicenter of these labor conflicts. The CLB's analysis attributes the surge in worker protests to the global economic downturn caused by the pandemic, leading to a wave of factory closures in coastal provinces and intensifying protest activities among workers. Guangdong, once hailed as the world's factory, has faced significant challenges, with foreign companies relocating and supply chains shifting to other regions. China's bakery and catering scene, a tale of economic woes.
In a distressing narrative, China's economic turmoil has cast a dark shadow, sparing not even the bakery and catering industry. The aftermath of post-pandemic unemployment has birthed a frenzy of new food ventures, igniting fierce competition and sparking ruthless price wars. The once thriving market has devolved from a realm of growth to a ruthless battleground, adding layers of complexity to an already strained industry. As the economic downturn, soaring costs, and cutthroat competition converge, the casualties mount, a staggering 1.2 million Chinese catering enterprises now hang in jeopardy. The heartbreaking shutdown of an upscale pastry shop, located strategically at a vibrant intersection on December 1, 2023. Previously recognized as Mad Edo and later rebranded as Asia Cake Shop, this establishment fell victim to the relentless economic challenges, mirroring a broader storyline resonating throughout China's culinary realm. This unfortunate incident underscores the harsh reality that even for businesses situated prominently in city centers, financial hardships can lead to bankruptcy and eventual closure. Businesses find themselves entangled in a web of challenges. The proprietor of a shuttered bakery shares a harrowing tale of six months in operation, bleeding approximately 1.1 million yuan. The economic strain, coupled with exorbitant operational costs, rent hikes, and meager profits, resonates as a common refrain among business owners, culminating in the agonizing decision to cease operations. The toll on China's catering and retail sector is staggering. The annals of 2023 witness the demise of over 120,000 bakeries and pastry shops, a grim testament to a surging closure rate. This ominous trend contrasts starkly with the emergence of a wave of two yuan bread shops, adapting to evolving consumer preferences in an increasingly price-sensitive market. Even esteemed brands such as Christine, Tiger Attitude, and Dim Sum Bureau of Momo find themselves ensnared in the economic quagmire, grappling with closures and painful downsizing. The erstwhile glamour of the high-end baking industry, rooted in opulent locales and extravagant décor, now battles a stark reality, a chasm between perceived value and the dwindling willingness of consumers to pay a premium. Investor interest in bakeries wanes, marked by a precipitous drop in financing events and amounts. Alarming data exposes the ephemeral lifespan of China's bakeries, with over half facing closure within a mere 32 months. Food industry saturation results in surplus food delivery drivers exploited by the CCP to manipulate the impoverished. Amidst a lingering three-year pandemic fallout, China grapples with a persistent economic downturn and soaring unemployment rates. The Chinese Communist Party, CCP, in its bid to inspire the youth, consistently promotes tales glorifying adversity. However, skepticism surrounds the narrative of Chin Su, a 26-year-old Shanghai food delivery driver who asserts earning an astounding 1.02 million Chinese yuan in three years by working 18 hours a day, fulfilling over 116,000 orders. Chin Su presented his income records during a January 13 interview, disclosing monthly earnings exceeding 40,000 Chinese yuan in August 2023, 25,000 Chinese yuan in September, 19,500 Chinese yuan in October, and nearly 26,000 Chinese yuan in November. However, fellow drivers expressed doubts about maintaining a stable monthly income of 30,000 Chinese yuan, questioning the feasibility of the claimed order volume given time constraints. While Chin Tzu may have embellished parts of his story, blame extends to the multitude of over 100 media outlets that package the struggles of the impoverished as inspirational tales, potentially misleading the lower class. Indeed, a video capturing the plight of Meituan food delivery drivers in Hangzhou, Zhujiang, has surfaced, depicting a distressing scene where drivers are brought to tears due to receiving a mere 1 yuan subsidy for covering a distance of 10 kilometers. This revelation exposes the harsh reality faced by these drivers, highlighting the exploitative nature of the industry. Adding to their woes, the sector enforces punitive measures that disproportionately affect those with fewer completed orders or less online time. This creates a cutthroat environment where drivers, driven by the need to meet order quotas, extend their working hours significantly, especially during adverse weather conditions or holidays. Once viewed as last resort occupations, the food delivery, courier, and ride-sharing industries now find themselves grappling with oversaturation, a predicament worsened by the lingering pandemic. 
Financial data from Meituan paints a grim picture, indicating staggering losses amounting to 23.5 billion yuan, $3.7 billion, in 2021, coupled with reports of employee layoffs in 2022. This stark reality underscores the systemic challenges and exploitative practices prevalent in these industries, raising concerns about the well-being of the workers who form their backbone. The CCP's official media often portrays individuals enduring harsh working conditions as positive examples. However, this approach minimizes societal inequality, fostering a perception that financial struggles result solely from individual effort. In essence, the narratives propagated by official channels may not serve as genuine inspiration but rather as a means to dissuade the impoverished from questioning their circumstances. The cycle of hard work for promised wealth, as presented by these tales, inadvertently contributes to the acceptance of the CCP's authoritarian rule among the lower class. China's Migrant Workers, A Tale of Struggle and Media Suppression In a recent turn of events, Netties, a prominent media platform in China, released a documentary on January 8, 2024, titled 30 Years of Working Like This with the revealing subtitle, Hafei, Migrant Workers' Survival Story. The documentary shed light on the arduous lives of China's grassroots laborers, emphasizing the challenges faced by migrant workers waiting for employment as early as 4 a.m., some of whom were unable to afford the 180 Chinese yuan CNY, health insurance, a burden exacerbating their already precarious situations. The documentary resonated with the public, sparking widespread discussion. However, on January 9, 2024, just a day after its release, the video mysteriously disappeared from circulation. Simultaneously, all related discussions and comments, including those on the Jihu website, were systematically erased on January 10, following the removal of the video on January 9. China Business Network, CBN, a media outlet affiliated with the Shanghai Municipal Committee of the Chinese Communist Party, CCP, swiftly responded by releasing a documentary titled Migrant Workers Waiting for Work on the Roadside in the Early Hours of the Morning. This documentary aimed to shed light on the struggles of lower-class migrant workers in a different province. The removal of 30 years of working like this and the subsequent deletion of CBN's report raised questions about the unusual behavior of official financial media, especially regarding narratives that deviate from the government's positive energy propaganda. The documentary focused on laborers who played a significant role in China's rapid urban development but found themselves in dire circumstances despite decades of hard work. The dividends of economic growth have eluded them, and they have become the forgotten generation, facing challenges such as unemployment, unpaid medical insurance, and the fear of old wages. The documentaries underscore the grim reality faced by these workers, emphasizing the pervasive issue of unpaid wages in a labor market that offers meager daily pay, lacks job security, and experiences intense competition. Hafei, despite being a rapidly developing city in central China, Witnesses daily wages for rural migrant workers slash to less than $25, exacerbating the difficulties of finding employment. The situation is worsened by companies' reluctance to hire workers over 55 years old, pushing this demographic to engage in odd jobs that provide daily settlements to avoid the risk of unpaid wages. The fear of owed wages and the struggle to survive in a competitive job market underscore the challenges faced by these workers. The articles then delve into broader issues within China's political landscape, touching upon the removal of critical articles challenging the Xi Jinping government's policies. This suppression extends beyond the realm of documentaries, indicating a broader trend of control over narratives deviating from the government's stance. The editorial upheaval is indicative of a broader trend in which media outlets, even those affiliated with the CCP like CBN, deviate from the official narrative. This phenomenon signals a significant shift in public opinion against Xi Jinping's government, with visible signs of discontent, such as the disposal of Xi's books on a university campus. In conclusion, the intertwined narratives of migrant workers' struggles and media suppression paint a vivid picture of the challenges faced by a forgotten generation in China. The suppression of critical media content reflects a broader struggle within the country's political landscape, as voices within the media industry openly challenge Xi Jinping's policies. These events mark a turning point, indicating growing dissent and an awakening among various segments of Chinese society against the CCP regime.